Well, all right, Kingdom Life, you understanding Revelation. Hey, mighty in spirit this morning. We don't have a lot of us here, but we praise God. People got Christmas stuff going, and it's all right. This is a revelation of who? Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ. I'll just review for a moment here at the start. We can't spend a lot of time in a review today. We've got a heavy, powerful chapter in chapter 11 of Revelation. This is, whoo, it's loaded. But I just want to say the book of Revelation, again, is a book of, it's a love letter to the church. It's a love letter to the church. In chapter 1, his heart of love, who he is. Ooh. In chapters 2 and 3, his people of love, the seven churches of Revelation. In chapters 4 and 5, the throne room of love, where love emanates from, the presence of God. In chapters 6 through 19, the cleansing power of love. The extent Jesus goes through to prepare this earth to reign with us. It's powerful. And then Revelation 20 through 22. Eternal purpose of love. That he might walk with us in intimacy forever and ever, nonstop, unhindered. I can't even get a glimpse of the glory of that. Who, what can separate us from the love of God? I'm telling you, this year has been an increase in my capacity to love. To, and to receive love. To receive his love. Yes. Not just loving him. You know, when the Lord gave us that revelation about John the Baptist. Or John. John the Apostle. I'm sorry. John the Apostle. John the Baptist was on the other side. He, he loved, but he also uh, he had a pretty heavy message of repentance. But I tell you, when I see John, that he got the revelation in the book of Revelation because he saw himself as a disciple that Jesus loved. So that's how I want to see myself. Now, outline of Revelation 11. Number one, the temple of the tribulation. Number two the two witnesses of the tribulation, and number three, the trump, trumpet of triumph. The seventh trumpet blows at the end of Revelation 11. The seventh trumpet, which is the final trumpet. It's the coming of the Lord. That's the seventh trumpet. That's talked about in Thessalonians, this trump of God. So we're going to see these. So first of all, the temple of the tribulation. Now let's Let's look a little bit at the temples that were built in Israel. And by the way, now chapter 11 of Revelation really be, begins to bring in strongly the nation Israel into the book of Revelation. Up to this point, it's been the bride of Christ. It's been mainly the body of Jesus Christ, not Israel. But now we see it, well, 144,000 was also an entrance. But now we see a strong emphasis in Revelation of the nation Israel and their part in the end times that they're going to play. I think you'll find it very exciting. First, the past history of the temple. Now, Solomon built the first great temple. Uh, Indiana University did a study on what it would cost today to replicate Solomon's temple. $500 billion today, $500 billion. To replicate, the, much of it was overlaid in gold. So this temple was a glorious temple. David gave 10,000 talents of gold <laughs> to the temple, which would, in today's would be millions of dollars, millions if not billions. So when he gave, the princes of Israel came and gave, and it took Solomon only seven years, but he had like 20,000 laborers. So you can build pretty quickly if you got a lot of laborers. But it was destroyed by Nebuchadnezzar and uh, 538 B.C. So after the destruction of that temple, Israel went for some time, but Zerubbabel built a temple. Following Solomon's temple, it wasn't as glorious. In fact, when the priests went to the temple, they remembered Solomon's temple, and they said they were, they were, their hearts were broken that this temple had n didn't nearly have the glory that Solomon's temple had. But it was destroyed by Antioch Epiphanes in 168 B.C. He offered a swine on the altar and polluted the temple and perverted the temple and, and also it was, it was literally torn down. And then behind that was Herod's temple. They went for years without a temple. Finally, Herod built a temple and, and this is the temple that Jesus ministered in. This is the temple surrounding the ministry of Christ in the Gospels. And it was destroyed in 70 A.D., and not one stone was left upon another. Remember Jesus gave that prophecy in the Gospels? No stone would be left. 
And along with the destruction of the temple in 70 AD was the genealogy of all of Israel. All the genealogies were destroyed. So you can't trace the Jewish origins today. Interesting, isn't it? But God knows who they are. So when he calls forth 144,000 from the 12 tribes, God knows ex exactly who they are. Now, the only thing that was left standing was the Wailing Wall, the Western Wailing Wall, after the destruction of the temple uh, in 70 AD. And they had to dig, actu actually excavate down below the ground. Now, the Wailing Wall today is greatly revered by the Orthodox Jews. They believe it's the pathway to heaven. And Jews from all over the world email to Jerusalem their prayer requests, and the Orthodox Jews go daily with those email requests and they stuff them in the Wailing Wall. Now we're going to be over there in May and we're going to see this in person when we go to Israel. It's going to be a lot of fun. We'll go to the Wailing Wall. Thank you. And be blessed. All right. So that's a little of the history. Now what do you notice about the repeated temples throughout history? They get destroyed. The enemy is constantly attacking Israel. So all of these temples that were built over the history of Israel have all been destroyed. Now let's look at the coming temples. So first of all, we have the past history. Now let's look at the present preparations of the temple. This is really interesting. If you go online, there's actually a Jewish website charting this as it happens. They are charting the rebuilding of the temple. The Orthodox Jews absolutely have made preparations. They, uh, we're going to see some pictures in a moment. There are some major problems with the Temple Mount. It's called the Mosque of Omar. We're going to see a picture of that in a moment, of all these Jew, uh, Arabs bowing, and they just literally fill the whole mound, around the Mosque of Omar. And so the, the is, Islamic nation has claimed the Temple Mount. But recent excavations have shown that actually the temple can be rebuilt a hundred yards north of the Mosque of Omar. So there's a possibility that the mosque doesn't have to be torn down for the Jewish temple to be built. Now, as I've said earlier, and by the way, I, I was surprised when I went online to find out a lot of the teachers are teaching the same thing. The Antichrist is going to rebuild the temple. In his covenant with Israel, at the beginning of the tribulation, he makes a covenant for seven years. And part of his deal with Israel and bringing peace to all those nations is guaranteeing Israel the building of this temple. Interesting. Now, I'm telling you, the Orthodox Jews have made preparations. I'm going to show you some pictures. This is actually a model that they have in Israel. It's going to be built exactly like this model. Now, you see the, see the court of the Gentiles off to the right there a little bit? We're going to talk about that in a few moments. But this is the model that they want to put up of the temp on the Temple Mount, the Jewish Orthodox. Not only do they have this prepared, but they've also got the menorah already built. It's encased, actually, outside in a waterproof case. So they got the menorah built. And not only the menorah, they have been breeding a hybrid red heifer and the latest report is that it is now ready. This strain of red heifer, because it's the ashes of the red heifer that dedicate the temple. So they've been working on this. This stuff is all in preparation. This is all part of the indication that the time is getting close, people. I'm not going to put any date on anything. But I, I'm telling you, yeah, exactly. But I'm telling you, the buds are on the tree. I believe we're entering a season that's getting very, very close to the fulfillment of a lot of these things we see. We looked at Matthew 24, remember? All the things that are going to be happening on earth, wars, rumors of wars, there's going to be pestilence on the earth. Uh, man, you go into the World Health Organization and the fear they have of a pestilence breaking out worldwide, some of the strains of uh, hybrid strains that no longer respond to antibiotics, and it, we could see another plague like was it, it, the black <coughs> bluebonic plague where millions died. And these kind of things were prophesied as in the latter days. We're seeing all this around. We see the earth in tra travail. We see more natural catastrophes in America than I've seen in my lifetime. 
just the last two years, the incredible strength of these storms and the, uh, the violence of nature is crying out. And, and Romans 8 says this was going to happen. The whole earth is groaning and travailing as a woman in birth. So I believe we're coming to the section where the woman's going to push. <laughs> and we're going to see the birth of some of these prophecies. They're going to be born in our day. I believe some of us in this room are going to see the coming of the Lord. That's my personal view. I believe I could see it. We know it's imminent, and it could happen any time. But I'm not talking about the rapture of the church. I'm talking about entering into a period called the tribulation period, as we're going to see in a few moments. All right, so the Jewish preparations are there. They want to build this temple as soon as possible. They're making the preparations. They claim they, claim they know where the Ark of the Covenant is. There's some claims, strong claims. On the, I'm not just weird old people on the Internet. These are Orthodox Jews, say they pretty well believe they know the exact location of the ark. So you got the red heifer, you got the menorah, you got the plans for the temple, you've got, you got the so-called location of the ark of the covenant. So they're ready to go. And the cornerstones. Yeah, and the cornerstones. Oh, that's right. The cornerstones. Yeah, you, thank you for studying. You always add a little bit to my teaching. I love it. All right. So preparations. Oh, by the way, now this is the, uh, the Mosque of Omar. You can see the enormous number of Islam people, I mean, the, the, you know, that are bowing before. So the, the temple would have to be, be built beside this. So you can see how much they have claimed this territory. They claim it as their own. And this is the location of the Temple Mount. So we have the Dome of the Rock, the Mosque of Omar on this. And it's the third most sacred spot in the world for the Islamic nation. So wars could be started over this hill. You understand that? So it's only somebody like the Antichrist that's going to be able to negotiate a peace settlement where everybody's satisfied. All right. Do we get the picture a little bit here? Okay, about the temple. Now, the vision of promise. There's a powerful message in the temple. The message is God is not done with dealing with Israel. He still has a future for Israel. We're going to see how Israel, in a few moments... But he will confirm a covenant with many, the Antichrist, uh, for one seven. Literally, that's the Greek, for one seven, which means a seven-year period. And in the middle of the seven, he will put an end to sacrifice and offering. So what do we know? What's going to happen in the temple? Sacrifices are going to be renewed. The Orthodox Jews are again begin to, they're going to begin to offer bullocks and lambs on the altar, and they're going to have daily sacrifices, and they're going to try to renew the old covenant on earth. Interesting, isn't it? All right. And he will put an end to sacrifice and offering, and at the temple he will set an abomination that causes desolation. So after all this work, rebuilding the temple, getting everything back in place... In the middle of the tribulation, the Antichrist marches in and says, listen, and he desecrates it. And again, the temple is defiled, as it has been throughout history. Now, God is allowing this. God's allowing this because he's, make, he's showing Israel something that's going to lead to their revival. He's showing them that the old sacrifices do not satisfy his justice. The justice has been satisfied at the cross. And they're going to get it. Their eyes have been blinded. But at this moment in history, their eyes are open. Don't you love this? They're going to see him whom they pierced. And they're going to weep and they're going to say, Wow, how could we have missed this Messiah all these years? We don't have to offer the bullocks. We don't have to offer the sheep on the altar. It's already been offered. Christ is the answer. But they're going to see that they brought him as sacrifice. Exactly. And so Daniel 9, you got to tie Daniel in with Revelation. Yeah. Their eyes are going to be open. They're going to see this. Now, uh, the vision of preservation, not only the, the vision of promise, but it's a vision of preservation. Isn't it interesting how God has preserved the nation Israel? That's one of the miracles of history. Through all the persecution, through all of the destruction of the Jewish people, God has still kept his people. For the end times. And in 1948, the Balfour Declaration, England 
declared that and established Israel as a nation. That was a miracle itself. If you had studied the history of how that happened, it was truly a miracle. How this even, how Israel could even become a nation. But you know what? I've been uh, studying it. I, uh, Mary Ann and I have talked a lot about Romania, for example. Romania just has all the resources. They've got very intelligent people. They've got great universities. They've got so much going for them, but they can't seem to get their nation on top. Financially, people are poor there. They're, they're struggling, and they have been. You know, I, I asked the Lord the other day, "What about countries like Romania?" And I was watching the History Channel, and you know what? Romania aligned with Hitler during the Second World War against the Jews. They'd never recovered from that. Isn't that interesting? Yes. I will bless them that bless thee. I am convinced that one of the reasons America has remained strong is we have befriended God's chosen people, the Jews. We've been a friend to them. We've protected them. We've been a refuge. And that's going to be major during the tribulation. Because when the abomination of desolation happens in the temple, that is the signal for Israel to flee to the mountains. Again, one of the greatest persecutions on earth is going to come upon the Jewish people. The Antichrist who befriended them, who made it a covenant with them, is going to turn on them and try to destroy them. I believe places like Petra, which I did a master's study when I was getting my master's degree. I chose Petra as kind of part of my biblical studies. That's a very interesting place, the, the country of the area of Petra, where you can go into this narrow little way, a, a hall, a rockway. What do you call that? <laughs> Not a tunnel, but it's, it's sheer walls. Uh, Petra and, and literally hundreds of thousands of people can flee into just Petra alone Many will flee back to the nations in the latter part of the tribulation because the way the nations treat the, the Jewish people during the latter part of the tribulation is going to be a, a, key, a key on how those nations are blessed and We saw that in Revelation. I mean in Matthew 24 as well Let him who is on the house top not come down you know, and the two men in the field, flee to the mountains. This is the time for Israel to have the signal to get out of town. Get out of Jerusalem because they will, they will possibly be killed if they don't. And it's, it's called the time of the Gentiles. You see, uh, the, uh, Jerusalem is given over to the Gentiles till the time of the Gentiles fulfilled. So there's going to be great destruction to get upon the Jewish people. But God is faithful. Amen? Amen. In Zechariah 12, 10, they will look upon whom they have pierced. Their eyes will be opened in this time of persecution. And then there's going to be a vision of punishment, not only a promise. There's been a vision of, pre uh, of preservation upon the Jewish people, but there'll be a vision of punishment. I'm telling you, the latter part of the tribulation, we're going to get into the other woes shortly. The first woe is today in Revelation 11. Now let's read Revelation 11 a little bit and let's get a picture here. And then I was given a reed like a measuring rod, and the angel stood saying, Rise and measure the temple of God, the altar, and those that worship there, but leave out the court which is outside the temple, and do not measure it, for it has been given to the Gentiles. And they will tread on the holy city underfoot for 42 months. So there's a there three and a half period, your period here, where the Gentiles are literally going to desecrate that temple. Again, it happens to Israel, but it's all part of God's purpose. So they see the true Lamb of God. And so the time of the Gentiles will be fulfilled. Israel will flee to the mountains. The Antichrist will have thrown, thrown himself in this temple as God. He's going to set up an image to himself right in the temple and defy it. So it's an intense time, and we're going to have to befriend the nation Israel at that time. So there's a vision of the punishment of the wicked, but there's also a vision of the punishment of the nation Israel for what they have done in turning away the Lamb of God. You see, the, the greatest judgment that's going to come on mankind is resisting Jesus Christ. There is no sin greater than than resisting faith in Jesus Christ. Because that's the sin that's ultimately going to judge all mankind. What have you done with Jesus? You know, we judge sins on this earth and say they're terrible sins, you know, we can name them. But it's the rejection of Jesus Christ that's the greatest sin of all. So God allows this to come upon Israel so they turn their heart to him. Isn't it interesting sometimes God has to allow judgments to come, to open our eyes? 
Amen? Amen. That's true in my life. I know sometimes, you know, I just get alone with the Lord and I say, okay, Lord, what's going on here, you know? And sometimes God will allow us to come under certain kind of pressure. Count it all joy when you fall into all kinds of trials, knowing that what? The trying of your faith works, works patience. Mm -hmm. And so they're going to find this new covenant in the blood of Jesus. So uh, it's exciting. Now, remember this. Israel and the church become united in Christ. There are not two separate covenants. I know John Haggai was teaching that, that Israel had a separate covenant. Rick Joyner called him on the phone, and there was quite a controversy a couple of years ago. And a lot of that was on the Internet, and I followed it. Because John Haggai was teaching that Israel was going to be converted under a different covenant than Christ. Well, I'm telling you, that's not true. There's only one covenant, and that's the blood of Jesus Christ. And we read in Galatians 3, let me just read this. For you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither what? Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is neither male nor free, female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are in Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. So it's a two-way action. The Jews are joined to the covenant of Christ and we are joined to Abraham's seed. We are grafted in to the tree. So there's not going to be two ways to salvation in the tribulation. One for the Jewish people and one for the Gentiles. They're all made one in Christ. Praise God. We're going to be one body in Christ. Even though there are 24 elders that represent Israel and the church, the apostles and the 12 tribes, God brings us all together in Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. Everything comes together in Christ at the end. He is before him, uh, and by him all things consist. Everything comes together in Christ. And so the Jews and Gentiles are joined in one. Now let's get into the two witnesses. I'm moving a little quickly. Are you with me so far? Mm -hmm. we, we, we good? Yes. We good? All right, we're good. Now let's get into the two witnesses. Because, see, God sends two signs to Israel. For their conversion. 144,000 witnesses. You know, there aren't that many people in Israel. What, six million people? You turn 144,000 witnesses loose on six million people. Hello? And these 144,000 are called at the beginning of the tribulation and set apart unto God and sealed. Man, I don't know what kind of an impact 144,000 Jewish witnesses will make, but I'm telling you, they're going to impact the world, not just Israel, but the tribes of the world, because out of them comes a great Gentile harvest as well. But you know what? The Jews seek a what? Sign. So God's going to give them two witnesses. Now, we're going to look at these two, and I'll give you my interpretation of what I feel or who they are. They could be Enoch, but we're pretty sure one's Elijah. Now, I particularly think they're uh, Elijah and Moses because of the kind of miracles they do. We're going to see that in a moment. But these two witnesses show up in Jerusalem. <laughs> Boy, we're getting blessed this morning. <laughs> Hallelujah. Okay. These two Jewish witnesses show up on the streets of Jerusalem, man. Old Testament prophets come back to life. Actually, they never died. I have a few questions about... Moses, although it says in Jude that the angel Michael argued with Satan over the body of Moses. And Satan did not bring again, or Michael did not bring against Satan a right railing accusation, the verse says, but says the Lord rebuke you. So when Moses was on the Mount Nebo, He was not allowed to enter Israel because he disobeyed by striking the rock. We know the story. So he never really got into the promised land until the ascension. Remember we taught that in Matthew? Moses did make it to Israel eventually on the Mount of Transfiguration. So we're not quite sure. It says Moses died. But anyway, there was an argument over the body of Moses. We know Enoch really never died in Genesis. He was taken and he was not. But anyway, I feel they're Moses and Elijah because God could certainly bring Moses back. Now, what do these witnesses do? They're called, actually, the word witness in the Greek there is, is the word martyr. It's the, there are several words for witness in the Greek. This is the word that's used for the martyr witness. Because these men are going to be killed. 
They're sent as a team, which, by the way, Jesus always sent them out what? Two by two. Two by two. Why? By the witness of two as a thing established. Instead of sending one prophet, God's going to send these two guys working together. It's going to be powerful. Now, they're very interesting. They're sent as a team. They're sent to prophesy. They speak prophetically over the nation Israel, telling Israel what God's about to do. I told you last week the prophetic is going to be released during the tribulation. God talks a lot about the prophets in Revelation 10 and 11. And so get ready for the prophetic. We released that last week, by the way. I thought that was powerful. Start prophesying. Start using your gift of prophecy. You're going to need it at the end of this age. These two witnesses are prophetic. And they're warning Israel. They're telling what's about to come. Then they're clothed in sackcloth. They're going to look different. They're not going to run around in business suits. They're going to look really strange. They're going to look like John the Baptist, you know, who was clothed with uh, uh, skins, you know, and whatnot. And, and these men are going to be noticeable. When they go around the streets of Jerusalem, you're going to notice who they are. And they're going to look different. They're going to appear different. And not only that, if anybody attacks them, fire comes out of their mouth and destroys them. Now that's good. That's going to make the news. <laughs> Could you just see this on CNN? You know, somebody is attacking these two guys on the streets of Jerusalem and bang, they're fried right there, you know. Maybe Fox, not CNN. Yeah, maybe Fox. Oh. <laughs> I love that. Maybe Fox, not CNN, certainly not MSNBC. All right. But, but these two men operate for three and a half years, the first half of the tribulation. They're called olive trees. Now, what, what do olive trees produce? Oil. And what does oil represent in the Bible? Anointing. These men are going to have an anointing upon them. And when they speak, <laughs> it's going to be powerful. And they'll be walking around Jerusalem doing signs and wonders and miracles. These are men of miracles. These two prophets are God are, are going to be powerful. And this is a sign to Israel. Get ready. I'm dealing with you as a nation. I'm giving you this gift of these two Old Testament prophets. And they're called candlesticks. What are candlesticks for? Light. They're going to be a light to the nation. So they'll have an anointing and they'll carry a light. Amen. We had a prayer time beforehand here. Man, we were praying for Tampa Bay, and the Lord reminded me again that this is a city of fire sticks. Woo! Hallelujah. I believe that Tampa is going to play a major part of the national revival Amen. in America. Will you agree with me? Prophesy! Uh, were, were you guys with me down there at the seven uh, uh, flames of fire at the University of Tampa? You were down there with us when we worshiped there, and this was a number of years back. We brought all the city leaders together, and uh, Frank was... Were you there? Yeah, Frank, your, your uh, brother was there, and, and Daniel Bernard was there, and some of the leaders of, of, of whole organizations in the city. We got together, because the Lord told me, he said, bring the people together and worship at the fire sticks. Do you know what Tampa means? Tampa is the word, Indian word, for fire sticks. Isn't that interesting? And this is the Bay of the Holy Spirit. And there are seven springs of healing in Safety Harbor. How many more signs do we need, huh? Just like God sends these two prophets to uh, Israel, God sends us signs even in our own city. So I'm believing next year, folks. I met with a commercial artist last night, and he's going to design our cards for our witnessing campaign next year, our Love and Life campaign. He's a young guy, just finished his studies in, as an attorney, and he just graduated from school. And... Uh, he does artwork, and he volunteered to do this. So I said, oh, okay, I'll give you a project. So he's going to put the posters together and the cards together. Don't be offended, offended now, Carol, all right? Because you've been doing all of our cards beautifully, and, and Susan did the last one. But he's going to do this one, and we're going to, next year is going to be our love and life campaign, amen? What the Lord showed me to do five years ago, and I didn't obey, when I heard Dr. Rubin down in, in uh, uh, Land, what is it, Lighthouse, Lighthouse down in Brandon, when I heard him speak prophetically that God was going to create a national move, the next revival was going to come out of this phrase, do you know that Jesus loves you and God has a plan for your life? Well, Rodney Howard Brown took it and he kind of refined it to his own mix and, 
And he's won, I think they've won over a million people to the Lord now in different cities and something called the Great Awakening across yeah. America. So really Dr. Rubin was right on target. Dr. Rubin was right on target. But the Lord rebuked me just a month or so ago. And you know where it came? Right in this prayer meeting. God rebuked me in this prayer meeting. And you know one of the truths that God used to excite me about doing this? Is when I studied the throne room in Revelation 4 and 5. That we have the power on earth to excite all of heaven. Did you get that? Yes. We have the power on earth to excite all of heaven. How do you do that? When you win somebody to Jesus. Every time you win somebody to Christ, the four cherubim around the altar and the 24 elders fall off their thrones and worship Jesus, the Lamb, and then all of heaven breaks out and prays. I would like next year to excite heaven a few times. Would you, are you ready? And the Lord spoke through Dr. Rubin that we, it is not our responsibility to win souls. That's God's part. You just plant the seed and water it. Just go around the city. Just tell everybody. And if we could get a few thousand people in the city, if we could get... I was praying for 50 churches with Nancy Conwell last night out at the prayer center that she just opened, by the way. We have to go out there and pray yes. at the ranch. Yes. A new prayer center has opened up, and that's going to be the prayer center for North Tampa for the Love and Life campaign. And it's her son who just graduated from his law degree that does artwork, and he has all of the graphics. He's got... Uh, uh, what is that uh, iMac graphic? It's similar to yours, I think. It's uh, Photoshop. Yeah, he's got Photoshop. So he's going to design this card for us. He says, let me do it. I, he wants to do it. So pray for him, and we'll have posters in these cards. And I, I'm, I was praying for 50 churches, and Nancy stopped me last night because we were praying in that prayer room. And it's right downstairs where you're, from where you're living, Jeff. You're living upstairs in that uh, new prayer room. You're right above the prayer room, brother. You to, you're going to walk in such an anointing. You're going to be flying through heaven this next year. And, and Nancy said, wait a minute, Jerry. You're not supposed to ask for 50 churches. She says, God says 100. I said, okay. So will you agree with me? That 100 churches will join hands in a love and life, maybe even more. But let's believe that God will bring some churches together, get them. You know what? It's the key to the church's growth. The light. And these two witnesses come as a light. Jesus is called a light. And then he says in, in the Gospels, don't hide your light under, under a what? A bushel. A bushel. And you're going to have so much fun using that little phrase. It's so simple and it's so effective. It works because it has an anointing on it. I know it sounds strange and sounds too simple. But when you keep telling people that, do you know that Jesus loves you and God has a plan for your life? It starts hitting them like arrows in their heart. And after they hear it about five or ten times from people in the city, they're going to start getting it. And then they'll receive Jesus. Amen. Are you ready for this? I'm ready. So, Olive trees and candlesticks, the two witnesses. All right. And the ministry of the two witnesses. Uh, how is their ministry defended? Well, like I said earlier, fire's going to come out of their mouth. You're not going to want to mess with these guys. They're going to have a reputation pretty quickly in Jerusalem. You better watch out if you don't want to get fried. You better leave them alone. So God's going to protect them. How is their ministry described as Moses and Elijah? The miracles that they're identified with, number one, is heaven... Shuts up so there's no rain. But would you turn the air conditioning on, brother? Uh, Gary, just turn the air conditioning on. All right? It got hot, really hot in here all at once. And uh, it's plenty cool outside, so we can cool that down. Take us down to at least 72 or something. Uh, one is what? Heaven's shut up. Now, what prophet caused that to happen in the Old Testament? Where it didn't rain? Elijah. Elijah. He shut the heavens up for three, and a half, for three and a half years, and then on Mount Carmel, we know the rain was released. And then secondly, the water was turned to blood. What? Prophet of God? Moses. So these seem to identify Moses and Elijah. And I would tend to think, it doesn't specifically say they have to be Moses and Elijah, but I think those d define well who these two witnesses are. Can you imagine the effect on Israel to see them, two Old Testament prophets come back? By the way, when the Old Testament saints were resurrected after the resurrection of Jesus and they were taken out of their temporary paradise and taken to heaven, it's in Matthew 12. Some of those Old Testament people appeared on the streets of Jerusalem on the way through to heaven. Interesting, isn't it? And so just like these people appeared on the streets, 
these men are going to come back. Well, they already were back once on the Mount of Transfiguration, so this is just another visit. Right? So Moses and Elijah, I believe, will appear again on the streets of Jerusalem as a witness. And so what, what's going to happen? Well, the massacre of the two witnesses. They're going to be killed. You know what? The Antichrist that arises out of the bottomless pit, it's called the beast. By the way, he's called the beast 38 times in Revelation. He makes war to kill these two. <laughs> it's going to take a war to kill these two prophets. He's going to, it's going to take an army. It says he makes war with these two prophets of God. Can you imagine how much power they have and how much fear they create on the earth? That the Antichrist has to raise up his army to destroy them. And they're going to be killed on the streets of Jerusalem. And their bodies are going to be left to rot. No man's going to bury them. That's what, exactly what it says. And I will give my power to my two witnesses, and they will prophesy 1,260 days clothed in sackcloth. And these are the two olive trees and the two lampstands standing before the God of the earth. And if anyone wants to harm them, fire proceeds out of their mouth. They have the power to shut up heaven that it doesn't rain, turn the water to blood. And when they have finished their testimony, the beast that arises or ascends out of the bottomless pit will make war against them, overcome them, and kill them. And guess what? Christmas time. Satan has his Christmas holiday, finally. He calls for a celebration. People start exchanging gifts. That's what it says. And their dead bodies will lie in the streets of the great city, which is spiritually called Sodom, and Egypt, which is Jerusalem, where our Lord was crucified. And those from the peoples, tribes, tongues, nations will see their dead bodies three and a half days and not allow their dead bodies to be put into graves. And those that dwell on the earth will rejoice. Because these two prophets have authority to release judgment on earth. What did I say about the church early in Revelation? Who releases the judgments on earth? The saints. Just like the saints release the judgments, these prophets can speak over nations and major things will happen. Major catastrophes. Judgments will come upon nations just because of the words of these two prophets. Power of prophecy, amen? So the world's going to have a worldwide celebration of, of evil. The, the, all of uh, the Antichrist and all of his followers are going to say, finally, we got rid of our problem. These two prophets have, from God, we got rid of them. And just like Satan thought he had a holiday when he put Jesus in the grave, he did have a couple of days off, you know what I mean? He had a little bit of a break. They're probably going to say, well, these guys couldn't have been from God because if they were, they would have been. Well, that's it. They could probably, well, they'll deny it. They'll say, sure, if they would have been from God, then they wouldn't have died. They claim to be, you know, well, but it's all, again, all, all part of God's plan. And, and at, listen to this. And after three and a half days, the breath of life from God entered them. Wow! The miracle of these two witnesses. The miracle of their resurrection, their awakening. The resurrection power of Christ is released through these two witnesses. I love this. And not only his resurrection power, but his rapture power is demonstrated. These two men not only stand on their feet on nationwide, worldwide television. There'll be daily reports showing their bodies on the streets. Nobody's going to touch them. The world's going to have a Christmas holiday. I'm talking about the world without Jesus. They're going to celebrate. They're going to give gifts. They're going to say our problems are over. The Antichrist is so powerful. He destroyed these two witnesses. He's our hope. They continue to look to the Antichrist. But they ride. They, on worldwide television, it says the whole world sees them. Well, we know that can happen today. Would it have a seven-second delay now from... Any part of the world. <laughs> so the live television is a seven second delay through satellites around the world. That's pretty alive. And these two men are going to stand on their feet and the world's going to be in amazement. In fact, look at the response. The breath of life from God entered them and they stood on their feet and great what? Fear fell on those who saw them. Wow. This is going to cause an, a continued awakening on the earth that God is doing something powerful, miraculous in this season. Then the miracle of their ascension. Not only are they going to stand on their feet, what are they going to do? 
And they heard a loud voice from heaven saying to them, Come up here. And they ascended to heaven in a cloud, and their enemies saw them. So not only on worldwide television are they going to, these men going to raise from their corrupted bodies decaying on the street into new bodies. They're going to not only stand on their feet, but as the television cameras are rolling, the reporters are stand, standing there in front of their cameras reporting to the world. Behind them, these two bodies begin to rise off the earth. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> Do you think that's going to get the world's attention? And an ascension is going to happen. I believe it's a picture of the rapture that's coming at the end of the tribulation, showing the power of Christ. And then the miracle of their avengement. Following their ascension, immediately a huge earthquake. The Bible says a great earthquake, by the way, which is the second in the book of Revelation. Four times, remember, we mentioned that great earthquakes are mentioned in Revelation. So these aren't just local earthquakes. These are catastrophic. And just in Jerusalem alone, 7,000 people are going to immediately die from this earthquake. Buildings are going to fall and collapse. The earth's going to be shaken. And they heard a voice from heaven saying, Come up here. And the same hour there was a great earthquake, and a tenth of the city fell. And the earthquake and 7,000 people were killed, and the rest were afraid and gave glory to God. Now, isn't it interesting? Some of these judgments now are beginning to turn people to God. We saw it in Revelation 8, remember? When men looked to heaven and they said, Who can withstand the power of this God? So all these things that the devil is doing is just going to begin to drive people to God. They're going to begin to fear God. They're going to begin to say things are happening on earth that we never thought were possible. We better get some help from above. And the second woe is past. Behold, the third woe is coming. And the seventh angel sounded. Now finally, ah, oh, we're done. It's a heavy chapter, isn't it? Wow. There's a lot of y'all with me so far? We're doing okay? Is this exciting? Awesome. It's awesome. God is going to deal with his people, with his nation, He's Israel. Faithful. He is faithful. He's going to fulfill everything he promised. And he's going to bring Israel to a national revival. Woo! Along with the nations and tribes and tongues of all the world. The nations of the world. This revival is going to... I'd love to be in Jerusalem when this thing hits. Wouldn't that be fun? Be. To see a national <laughs> repentance that, that the remnant that is left in Israel almost entirely, entirely is going to get saved. A veil lifted from their eyes and they look on him whom they pierced and they say, why have we not been able to see Jesus? Because a darkness came upon them. A blindness came upon their heart. Which Romans chapters 9, 10, and 11 speak about. But God's going to lift that veil. That's exciting. That's exciting to me. Now, what's the rejoicing? This is the seventh trumpet. Now, John gets a picture of the coming of the Lord. Following the death of these two men, now he kind of jumps to the end of the tribulation. By the way, this is a parenthesis. Remember we said it's part of the parenthesis? Mm -hmm. So the parenthesis is both chapters 10 and 11. We're not back into the chronological events until chapter 12. So we're going to get back into that following this teaching. So after the first of the year, we'll be back into Revelation 12, and we'll pick up again the bowls, the final seven judgments that come on the earth and the woes. So we still have some pretty interesting things coming on planet earth. But you get a picture of the tribulation here today, a little bit better picture of how things are going to fall out and come to pass. I'm excited. I'm getting a better understanding of this. And the seventh angel sounded. Now this is the seventh trump. Remember the last chapter, we had the six trumpets, and no, I'm actually Revelation 8, we had the six trumpets, and then we had the parentheses in chapter 9 and 10, and now we've got the seventh trumpet blowing. And this is the trump of God that Thessalonians talks about, which is the coming of the Lord. Look what happens, I love it. And the seventh angel sounded, and there were loud voices in heaven saying, The kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ. Woo -hoo. And he shall reign forever and ever. Oh, I love this section. Don't you love this? This is a triumphant trumpet. Declaring the kingship of Christ. The seventh angel blows and said, listen. It is now time that the king takes over. This is his point of rulership over planet earth. We looked, we looked, uh, well, last week. When he put his hand, feet on the land and the sea, and he remember he took ownership in that Christophany, that appearance of Christ on earth, of uh, getting the title deed out of Revelation 5, 
and we saw Jesus establish by his feet his ownership over earth. Now this is declared by the seventh angel. Now he says it's time for it to be fulfilled. Now let's read about it. I love it. And the 24 elders with, uh, sat before God on their thrones and fell on their faces and worshiped, saying, We give you thanks, O Lord God Almighty. Now let's look at this ruler that's coming, who is Jesus Christ. There's rejoicing over him in heaven. I believe we'll be rejoicing on earth too. Amen. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to join in with heaven, aren't you? Amen. Jesus prayed what? Heaven come to earth. That was his prayer. Here we see the fulfillment finally of that happening. The scope of his kingdom. Do you know the word kingdoms here is not in the Greek? It's singular. Jesus takes over the kingdom of the earth. It's a singular kingdom. He is Lord now of earth as well as heaven. This is his time <laughs> to possess planet earth with his people, with us. One who is and was and is to come. So the span of his kingdom is forever and ever. Forever and ever. We know his kingdom, there is no end. And the strength of his kingdom, he's called the Almighty. We talked about the zeal of the Lord in Isaiah 9, 6. I love that verse. It's almost like a Christmas verse. What, what, how does it start? Remember? Isaiah 9, 6. Oh, okay. Isaiah 9, 6. It's a beautiful, it's a beautiful one about his kingdom. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Those that are in darkness will see a great light. But the zeal of the Lord will perform it. Government. The government shall be upon his shoulder, and of his kingdom, of his government, there shall be no end. His name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Is this going to be a good day on planet Earth? Here we, yeah, read it real loud. Yeah, Isaiah 9, 6, and 7. For unto us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder. And his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father of Eternity. This is the Amplified Version. Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and of peace there shall be no end. Mm. Upon the throne of David and over his kingdom, to establish it and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness from the latter time forth, even forevermore, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. Woo! Glory to God. Oh, I lost my place. Hallelujah. Is this a glorious section? Amen. You have come and taken your great power, says Revelation. The nations were angry and your wrath has come. Now, what did Psalms 2 say? Kiss the son lest he be angry. He's going to come back with a rod of iron, but in love. You see, strong rulership. I, I love Derek Brooks. Do you like Derek Brooks? Derek Brooks, of all the Buccaneers, is the most generous, gracious ex-Buck in Tampa Bay. I'm listening to an interview of him on television. And the interview asked Derek Brooks, what has made you like you are? He said, when I was in the fifth grade, he said, I was the biggest goof off in school. He said, I had the reputation in my grade school of terrorizing my teachers, just goofing off. He said, I was in the fifth grade and my dad showed up in my classroom, took me in front of the class, got out his belt, and whipped my butt. He said, it changed my life. <laughs> Can you imagine getting a spanking? Now, this would not be allowed today in school. But he said, the reason, he said, it turned my whole heart from being a rebellious, self-centered, into somebody that's become generous, one of the most generous men in our community. He said, it was my dad's discipline that turned my heart. You know what that tells me? When something's done out of love, <laughs> this rod of iron is going to be hard to live with. It's going to give us security and direction and protection and wisdom because there's going to be no rebellion in the millennium. Zero! Yeah, that's the word. He's going to rule with a rod of iron and we'll all be Derrick Brooks. 
Because of his rulership, Jesus is going to, but it's going to be pure love. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth and scourgeth every son. Listen, if you never get scourged for your sin, you're not a child. The Bible, I excuse the word, but he calls us bastards. Illegitimates. He says, you're not in the family. If you're in the family and, you, and you're living perpetual sin and you never get spoken to by the Holy Spirit about this, put it down. You don't know, you don't know the, the God of the Bible. So Jesus is going to rule, man. It's, but there'll be order. There'll be divine order. There'll be wisdom. There'll be righteousness on the earth. There'll be justice. Woo! No injustice on planet Earth. Can you imagine living a thousand years without any injustice? Mm -hmm. This king, no wonder heaven rejoices and says it's finally come. What we've been dreaming about for millenniums on the earth is finally happening with the arrival of the king. Hallelujah. Woo! Woo! And the nations were angry. And, and the time of, 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 the, of the dead, that they should be judged at the end of the tribulation, and that you should reward your servants, the prophets, and the saints. Mm -hmm. It's our time of reward. Mm -hmm. When the king shows up, he's not going to judge us for our sin. That's already been dealt with at the cross. You're not going to show up and say, okay, now your life's going to appear in front of you like some videotape of everything you've done bad. That's not... His judgment is a reward. It's a reward time. He said, listen, I've already taken all your sins at the cross. You don't need to deal with that any longer. But here's what I'm going to bless you. Well done, thou good and faithful servant. You've been faithful and little. Now I'm going to give you South Atlantis. Who wants South Atlanta over here? Oh, what about New York? Who would like to rule over New York? Let, who wants New York? All right. Oh, you want New York? Okay. You want New York, Susan? All right. Well, you can rule over New York. Yeah. <laughs> you're, you're thinking of New York Harbor, right? What do you want, Gary? You want California? Where? Turks and Caicos. Turks and Caicos. He's an island man. I like this. He's going to, he's going to rule over islands. Anybody else have a favorite spot? Put your request in. Nassau Bahamas. Nassau Bahamas. Let's go lay on the beach. Come on. It's... Hawaii. Honolulu. <laughs> Joe's going to ride the surf, man. He is going to ride the surf. He's going to have a Holy Ghost surfboard. All right. So I'm telling you, this is a time of celebration, of rewards, of those that have been faithful. I've been preaching this for 30 years. You are now positioning yourself for rulership. Amen. Your life character and conduct in this time of your life is positioning yourself for rulership with Christ, Gary. Yeah. Now, I don't know about you. I'm not big on investments. I just kind of follow whatever, you know, because I've never studied investments. But if, if I could take $80 and invest it with a guarantee of 10,000 truckloads of gold, would that be a good investment? <laughs> 10,000 truckloads of gold lined up all the way from here to Atlanta, right? Mm -hmm. Solid gold in the truck. You say, what are you, what are you saying, Jerry? Listen, think of this. By investing 80 short years of your life completely for the kingdom, you're going to get a reward for more than 10,000 truckloads of gold. You're going to get a reward for eternity. Yeah. Doesn't it even make good business sense to serve the Lord? Yes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Just from a strict investment standpoint, not even talking about the spiritual stuff, your capacity to enjoy Christ is going to be influenced by how you live here in eternity. Think of that. You are positioning yourself for eternal rule now. Let's get with it. I like Beverly. She comes in every Wednesday morning and prays for repentance. <laughs> Lord, help the church to repent. And you know, the passion behind that prayer is so that we can reign with Christ freely. God's not against this. Repentance, you know what repentance does? Repentance separates you from your bondage. That's all repentance does. Repentance is a way of getting rid of all of your bondage. I'm going to preach here in a minute. All right. And you should reward your servants, the prophets, and the saints, and those that fear your name, small and great, and you should destroy those that destroy the earth. Wow. God loves this earth. And he says, the people I have remaining behind are going to learn how to take care of planet earth. This planet is going to be so beautiful. Don't you love beautiful grass and 
flowers. And when we were up at, uh, at Callaway Gardens up there in Georgia for this conference with Clint, you know, they have, what, 36 whole golf course and nothing but gardens. We rode around that place for an hour and saw nothing but flowers and trees and beautifully groomed fields. Golf course. It was gorgeous. I've never seen a place as large as that that was that kind of a garden called Callaway Gardens. It's taken them uh, 40 years for this family to develop the place into the beauty it's, it's at. Can you imagine the entire earth? No weeds, no curse on planet earth. It just, it, it's going to be so much fun. It's going to be fun to live here. So we're getting ready for this thing. Amen. And I'm going to finish here. I know you're getting... All right. And the temple of God was opened in heaven, and the ark of his covenant was seen in the temple, and there were lightnings, noises, thunders, lightnings, earthquake, and a great hail. Now, not only... There's rejoicing, by the way. They'll be rejoicing over wickedness being destroyed. Let me just read Psalms 2. We'll just step back for a moment. One, the one enthroned in heaven laughs. The Lord scoffs at them. He rebukes them in their anger and terrifies them in his wrath, saying, I have installed my king on Zion, my holy mountain. I will proclaim the Lord's decree as he said to it, You are my son, today I, uh, I have become your father. So in other words, he's establishing his kingdom uh, in a throne, throneship. Ask of me and I will make the nations your inheritance, the ends of the earth your possession, and I will break them with a rod of iron and dash them together like pottery. So God prophetically showed David what was going to happen at the end of this age. Finally, the rewards we get. And finally, behind that is the rejoicing over the reality of heaven. Finally, there will be a divine connection, get this, physically of heaven and earth. There will be a divine connection. The reality of heaven is going to be our living reality daily. That's going to be fun. Amen. The temple of God in heaven, which was the pattern that Moses saw of the tabernacle. That temple of heaven, God's going to make a reality. We're going to live in that reality, the ark of his presence. That's what the ark represents, is his presence. You think you can enjoy the presence of God now? Wow. What will our resurrected bodies be able to handle of His presence? Now we see through a glass darkly. But then what? Face to face. I continually want to increase my capacity to enjoy the presence of God. 